First of all, I just want to start by saying I'm really excited to be here to be able to talk about some of the stuff that we're doing with the Park Service, um, and especially the stuff obviously related to OpenStreetMap. Um, I want to start off by saying that OpenStreetMap is totally brand new to us. We're just kind of getting started. Um, we're not experts. And so we're really looking to kind of start um, a conversation with you all, the OpenStreetMap community, about the plans that we have. And, um, you know, we're looking for feedback. And please let us know if uh, any, any of our plans, are, um, if they need to be modified or changed or anything like that. And so um, with that, uh, my name is Nate Irwin, and I work for the National Park Service. And for those of you who don't know what the National Park Service um, does, um, we basically protect over 400 of America's uh, special places, so cultural and natural resources. Um, and we protect some of, the, some of the world's most iconic places, including uh, Canyonlands National Park, uh, Yellowstone, Golden Gate here in San Francisco, Kenai Fords in Alaska, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And by the way, all of these photos that I just showed you are from the new Department of Interior Instagram account, which if you're interested in just looking at, looking at beautiful photos of um, America's public places, um, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, the username is US Interior on Instagram. And our team basically does digital mapping for the Park Service, and that includes actually building out um, individual web maps, and we're starting to get more into mobile maps as well. And I just wanted to show you a few examples of the types of maps that we build. Um, I apologize, the slide is a little, the slides are a little cut off here on the edges, but um, this is an app that we built uh, to help celebrate the uh, Civil War 150th anniversary. And so it's a pretty basic app um, that allows you just to kind of interact with uh, Civil War locations that are around the world, uh, around the country, and um, basically build out an itinerary of destinations. And hold on one second. Sorry, the resolution is a little messed up and it's messing with my presentation. Um, this is another uh, example. We've actually worked with the Air Resources Division of the, of the Park Service to um, kind of help them put their air quality data um, on, into a mapping environment. And I won't have to do this the entire presentation, I promise. Um, and then this is an app that we built for um, Richmond National Battlefield Park. And it basically helps, um, helps the park visualize uh, troop movement data that occurred during the Battle of Beaver Dam Creek back during the Civil War. And so these are just a few examples of the kinds of apps that we build. But in addition, we also help others make maps. And so as we take on these individual projects, we also um, we develop policies and build tools that make it easier for others within the Park Service to, to do mapping. And so that includes providing access to technologies and services. So we actually maintain uh, license agreements with a number of companies, um, including uh, CarterDB, Mapbox, MapQuest, Bing, and Google. We also host infrastructure for parks. So it's becoming more and more difficult for parks themselves to set up servers. And um, so basically what we're doing is we're allowing parks to come to us. We set up infrastructure for them that they can use for, for uh, digital mapping. We also develop guidance um, on accessibility, usability, um, uh, technology recommendations, all of those types of things. So we develop guidance for parks and uh, document it and put it out there. And in addition, we develop, uh, build and maintain a set of tools that we use for all of our maps and we make available for others to use as well. And so that includes, we actually uh, develop and maintain our own JavaScript library. It's called the NPMAP library. And basically, it's a web mapping abstraction library that wraps functionality around, um, around uh, APIs, like Bing and Google and um, Leaflet and Modest Maps. And if you're interested in finding more information, you can go to our website at nps.gov slash npmap. And everything, um, the, the library is actually open source. It's up on GitHub. It's available under the MIT license. And you can also look at um, quite a few examples, uh, kind of targeted code examples that are available on our website as well. And so let me just go into one of them here. So you can switch between the different, um, what we call base APIs that are supported by the library, like I said, Bing, Google, Leaflet, Modest Maps. 
at the bottom of each of the maps, there is a code example that you can um, you can just copy and paste and uh, into a file and run it from your own um, from your own computer. Okay. Something else that we build and maintain another tool is. Um, is called Park Tiles, and Mamatha, who's going to be talking here in just a little bit, is kind of running the lead on this. And basically, it's a set of base map layers that um, that you can kind of combine and in, uh, in, in, in overlay, and you can actually make obviously mix in your own custom data. So just to show you kind of um, an example of a map that you might be able to develop very easily um, using Park Tiles. And so the goal of Park Tiles is basically to reproduce um, Kind of the traditional uh, Unigrid maps that the Park Service has been creating for for you know for years and years, and bring those into kind of a digital interface and make those available via the web. And I think Mammoth is going to be talking a bit more about that. And lastly, um, we're also currently working on this tool. It's called the MP Map Builder, and it's basically like a wizard-driven um, interface that a user can use to walk through the process of building a web map and actually deploying that web map into uh, their Park Service website. And so basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to create um, all of these tools, um, you know, the guidance that I talked about, um, the licensing. We're, we're, tr we're basically trying to eliminate barriers and make web mapping, digital mapping, easier for our parks. So for people who aren't necessarily technical, who aren't developers, who you know don't know anything about the first thing about code or, or hosting infrastructure, we're trying to kind of eliminate barriers and make web mapping more accessible for them. So all of that's great, but the problem is the data, really. I mean, we you know we've created all these tools that make like creating the front ends easier, uh, creating services, all taking care of all these technologies. We've kind of we've kind of solved all of those problems, but what about the data themselves? And for us, and I think for most people, data is really hard. Um, the Park Service, we have to deal with you know, bureaucratic inertia. Um, one of the first tasks that I had to tackle when I started working for the Park Service five or six years ago um, was developing a data standards for buildings. And um, I, you know, I thought that was a pretty easy task. Um, I, was on, I was part of a work group. Um, we sat down, came up with attributes that we, we thought would be, um, that we thought would be required by the standard. And uh, it ended up taking us three years to work it through the bureaucracy. So it, it can just these things can take forever. Um, the Park Service is also federated, and it's a bottom-up organization. So a lot of um, a lot of organizations, federal organizations, have centralized funding that they can pass down to parks, or pass down to uh, you know to, to divisions and in, in, that are underneath them. And the Park Service is the complete opposite. Money comes into the parks themselves, and then. Um, they don't really have any incentive to necessarily participate in like enterprise initiatives or anything like that. And so this is really where, where we envision OpenStreetMap coming in and kind of helping us solve some of these problems. And really what I want to talk about from here on out is this places of interest um, system. And of course, everything in the Park Service has to have a name. So we've, we've given uh, this system a name of places of interest. And basically the goal of this system is to make it easy for everyone, and I'm talking about like non-technical people, to contribute data back into our authoritative data sets. And we also want to streamline getting our data into back out into OpenStreetMap. So make it possible for you know, these authoritative data like trails, like buildings, like um, campgrounds. We want, to make, we want to make it possible to get the data back into OpenStreetMap. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to empower our employees um, to basically tell stories in ways that they've never told them before. We also want to increase transparency and we want to engage with the public. And honestly, we can just use the help. I mean, the Park Service maintains over 85 million acres of land. Um, just to give you kind of an example, Denali National Park in Alaska is the size of the state of Vermont. And so we, we don't have any employees who do data. A very small percentage of the 20,000 plus employees that, that are employed by the Park Service actually know what GIS is. And so we want to be able to take advantage of those people. So I, just, I thought it would be good to give you an example of kind of um, how we're going to end up using data that come in through the places of interest system. 
And I thought a good example was the Yellowstone Lives uh, application that we're currently working on. And basically, our goal is to take this map that you, that you see here. Um, we're, we want to basically make it live. So this is, again, a hard copy brochure map um, that if you go into, like, say, the entrance station at Yellowstone, um, you might, a, a ranger might hand, hand you a map like this. And basically, we want, to, we want to turn every bit of information on this map into kind of a live dynamic experience that's constantly updated, that has, um, you know, traffic integrated and all of those things. And so the different components of a map like this um, that we want to show um, might include, like, the location of snowplows. So, uh, in, you know, in the spring, if a park um, is sending snowplows out to try to open roads, we want to show the locations of the snowplows on the roads. Um, we might even integrate, like, real-time geyser eruption information for Yellowstone. Obviously, that's not uh, applicable for our, all parks. Um, we want to show uh, the status of roads, including uh, traffic information. So we saw a great presentation yesterday on, on doing traffic with OpenStreetMap. Um, we also want to show uh, entrance station status and campground status. Um, so we're talking about front country and back country campsites. So I get asked this all the time. Um, and people say, well, why can't you just use OpenStreetMap as is? Why can't you just take the data out of OpenStreetMap, put it into your products, and use it? Well, I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of the licensing issues, um, the, the conflicts basically between ODBL and um, in public domain. So everything that we do is available in the public domain because we're part of the US federal government. There are also major liability issues that we have to deal with. So we can't just take data um, really from any place, um, especially, you know, obviously from our GIS departments and stuff like that we can, but we can't just take data and put it out there for the public. There are um, tremendous liability issues. Once we put a map onto, say, our website, um, we have to, we're basically vouching for the data that are shown on the map. Um, and uh, just, to, just to kind of provide some context for this, um, in Death Valley a couple of years ago, um, a lady was driving and she turned, she was following like, I guess, a GPS device. And uh, she turned down a road that the GPS device told her to turn down. And it just so happened that it wasn't actually open to the public. Um, she got lost and she was stranded for a couple of days. Um, and uh, fortunately she was rescued, but um, uh, she had an infant with her in the car who, who passed away. And this became, this really like struck home obviously with the park service and it, it kind of struck home with the federal government in general. And we decided obviously that we need to start really producing and publishing really good information. But um, we can't just take op raw open street map data that hasn't been vetted by the park service and put it out there. So just to give you, just to kind of start to get di like down into the weeds a little bit about um, how we're looking at uh, integrating OpenStreetMap with our workflows. First of all, we want to introdu introduce our parks to OpenStreetMap. So this is, this is a major sea change, obviously. If we're, if we're asking our parks to start to contribute data back into OpenStreetMap, um, or if we're asking them to start using crowdsourced data, um, it's, gonna, it's a major paradigm shift, and um, there's, there's, you know, a lot of the processes that the Park Service uses and that the federal government uses for doing data um, have been around for a long time. And it's gonna take us uh, you know, a long time to actually get people to buy into this. And so the first step is really just getting people, our parks, familiar with OpenStreetMap, uh, you know, to telling them the advantages of using um, a crowdsourced database and kind of getting them on board with that. Um, this also includes kind of getting our GIS community on board. Um, with using OpenStreetMap as well. And this has, been, this has been really difficult up to this point because you know, there's lots of skepticism um, am amongst the GIS community about crowdsourced data in general. And um, so it's gonna take us a long time to get there. So what exactly are we looking to do? Well, first of all, we're gonna piggyback on all of the, uh, the great design and development work that's gone on um, uh, with uh, the new ID editor. And basically, we are going to uh, take ID and customize it um, so, the, so it kind of fits into how we do things in the park service a little better. And when I say customizations, I mean, we're going to show park service areas of interest. Um, so, you know, it's, it's obvious where, um, for which areas we want to collect data um, using, this, using the interface. We're going to allow parks to define priority themes. So say for, I don't know, say Great Smoky Mountains decides that they want, um, they need a, a trash can layer or something like that. 
then they can actually define that. We can, um, we can make that, that theme visible within the editor and um, people who are using it, you know, non-technical park service employees or OpenStreetMap contributors, members of the public, whatever, um, can go into the interface and we'll know that we're looking, we're looking for trash cans. Um, we'll also obviously uh, set up and establish detailed presets for all of the different types of data that we're looking at collecting through the, through the ID interface. And lastly, we're going to obviously add authoritative MPS data to the interface so we can start to uh, you know, provide context for, for users who are, are using it to digitize um, data for us. We're also looking at extending the, the functionality of ID itself. Um, and just a couple of ideas that we've had up front, and I'm sure we're going to be adding to this list. Um, we want to support uh, adding shapefiles and file geodatabases to, um, to ID. So again, providing context for people who are digitizing um, on the map. And we want to we want to add some uh, or enhance the conflation tools. And so this is um, kind of just a preliminary, very preliminary architecture, kind of what we're thinking of how, how this whole thing might actually work. Um, and so basically we're looking at having um, two instances of ID, one public facing and one that we use internally. And so the internal instance, um, our employees, and again, we're, we're talking about all of these non-technical employees who have never really used a desktop GIS before. Um, they'll be able to come to this interface and digitize information. So again, digitizing roads, trails, um, campgrounds, those types of things. But we're also interested in allowing them to digitize uh, kind of more maybe temporary data. So say that um, a park is having a trail race and they want to put a map up on their website that shows all of the water stops along the trail. Um, well, we want, we want them to be able to, to create that type of data as well. And so. Um, so we're not, just we're not just talking about authoritative data or official GIS data or anything like that. Once data come in through that interface, it will go into a validation and approval queue. And at that point, that's where kind of the, the more traditional GIS community and the park service will be able to interact with it um, via desktop GIS. So they're going to be able to you know, uh, improve upon the data um, there. The, the traditional, the database, that database itself will be synced up with an internal instance of OpenStreetMap that we're going to be running. And um, that instance of OpenStreetMap will be driving um, the park tiles uh, base map that I showed you just a little while ago. And again, Mammoth is going to talk more about that. The um, data coming in from the external version of ID will go two different places immediately. Once, once say, a line's created, it'll go into the internal validation approval queue, which will then you know, put it in kind of like the more traditional GIS realm within the park service. At that point, it can make it into um, one of our authoritative data sets, and we'll publish that out. And it also goes directly into OpenStreetMap. So there's kind of that immediate feedback um, loop. So uh, anybody who's using the, our, our customized, our self-hosted um, instance of ID will still be contributing directly to OpenStreetMap. They'll, they'll just also be contributing uh, data into into our database. So that's our preliminary plan. Um, it's going to take us a little while to get there, but we have kind of some questions that remain. Um, this whole question of like ODBL and public domain, that's something that I think we're going to just we're just going to have to continue to kind of uh, evaluate, and, but we're interested in, you know, any, if anybody's talking about how we can make um, ODBL um, and public domain work better together, or maybe just a new license altogether or something, we need, we need to take care of that issue, but we're really interested in that. We're also interested in kind of like setting up our parks as stewards of data for an in, in OpenStreetMap for their particular area, and we're interested if anybody else has, has looked into this at all. Um, so say again that, um, say Yellowstone National Park, they want to kind of, they want to be active in OpenStreetMap, they want to um, work with the community to help improve data that, and maintain data for the park. Um, is there, is, does this concept of, of a steward of data for a particular area actually exist or is it even appropriate? Um, we also want to look into ways at um, automating OSM updates from authoritative park service data. So going back to this diagram here, you can see that the, the dotted line uh, between the ARC SDE database and, and the public uh, or the, you know, the, the, the production instance of OpenStreetMap, that's kind of one of the big missing pieces right now for us technically. We don't really know how we're going to do that. Um, 
And is there a way to kind of automate taking data out of our authoritative data sets, roads, trails, campgrounds, and, and kind of putting them into OpenStreetMap and also then hopefully kind of syncing up or coming up with, up with a way to sync um, our internal databases with OpenStreetMap. And lastly, um, if we come up with tagging guidelines to park, for park service areas, um, you know, is the OpenStreetMap community kind of willing to, willing to follow those guidelines when, when creating data for, um, for park areas? So those are questions I have for the community, and I'd love to chat about those um, if, if you all have any ideas. But um, next steps, um, basically, we're looking at setting a lot of this, the technical underpinnings of this system up. Um, initially, right now, we're just interested, though, in getting, again, our parks interested in OpenStreetMap. And so we're actually going out to, uh, to parks right now, looking at parks who are interested in kind of prototyping some of these ideas out. And um, if you're interested in the system or do you just want to get in touch, um, we're on Twitter at NPMAP. And we actually have, we put up a website for the Places of Interest system. Right now it just has a landing page, but if you go to nps.gov slash POI, there is, um, there's a little form there. You can sign up for an NPS OSM mailing list. And basically we're going to be using that um, both internally and to communicate with, with you know, OpenStreetMap con contributors and members of the public who are interested in contributing data back to us. And that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I'm, I'm, what do you mean by categorizing liability? Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I, I suppose we haven't really gotten that far yet. Um, we're still trying to figure out um, exactly what that internal validation approval process is going to look at. Um, the, the park services have had this concept for a long time of like um, each park has uh, a single person who is kind of the authority uh, for that park. I mean, and they can have lots of people helping them out, but there's one person who signs off on officially on data. And so I imagine that we'll probably try to plug into that concept um, for this. And so, you know, um, as far as like, yeah, having a hierarchy of, um, of importance for liability, I don't think we've gotten that far yet. Um, again, I don't think that's, that's kind of one of the biggest missing pieces is that step. Um, and we've, we, we have to figure that out. I think initially what we'll do is, um, we're just going to put, uh, we're going to punt that down the road a little bit, but, um, we'll probably just end up putting the data out and make them available. Um, if, if people want to upload them or take them and put them in OpenStreetMap. Um, and I think we're going to have to get to that point internally, um, where the, the, the data are all going to be versioned, um, but as far as yeah, merging those in OpenStreetMap, I'm not sure. Right. I, yeah, I think it's going to be a long road. I mean, it's taken us, um, we've put a lot of work just in getting uh, park service leadership to buy into this. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, I don't think we're, we're even there. I mean, just kind of explaining, I mean, these are really, you know, some of these concepts are very technical. Um, so I think it's easier almost to get people who aren't from like non-traditional GIS people interested in this, right? Because they see the power of social media. They're not necessarily attached to like a certain way of doing thing, things, but um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's just gonna it's gonna be a, a, a long slow process, and I think we're gonna have to show value, um, and we're gonna have to show that these ideas actually work. And so, you know, our goal is to um, kind of 
show that, um, you know, if if we are able to adopt and, and do these things and, and get people to participate, then we can produce better products than we can produce otherwise. And I think some of the stuff that um, Mammoth, Mammoth is going to show here in just it, in the last talk, um, I think I think we're going to we're going to be able to sell it. I really do. Once we start making progress. Um, so, yeah, it's not a great answer, but I think it's <laughs> it's a monumental task for sure. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think they do either. And I think that's that's a, a, a another big part of this project is educating the park service. But as far as yeah, um, you know, trying to kind of establish points of contact uh, within the OpenStreetMap community for each park, I, I think that'd be that'd be great. That'd be incredible. And um, Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. You what? Uh huh. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can try. <laughs> I mean, data.gov is, is a bit disconnected from uh, the actual agencies, at least in my experience. Um, I think the, the new version is a major improvement, and I know that they are doing more outreach to, you know, to, to agencies like the Park Service. Um, so I'll try, to, I'll try to get that on the radar for sure. Right. Okay. Yeah. And um, Ma again, Mammoth is going to talk about uh, one of the prototypes that we've been doing at Great Smoky Mountains. But um, we've actually gone through and developed, a, you know, a pretty comprehensive wiki page um, on tagging for National Park Service um, locations. So. Yeah, I know that most parks um, classify trails like that, and so we'll definitely want to integrate that for sure. Yeah, so um, when I was talking about customizations for the ID editor, like I, like I said, for each park, I think we're going to go out and say, what are your priority themes? What kind of data do, do you want help with? Um, and I think it's going to differ for, from park to park. Um, I, you know, some parks, even some medium-sized parks, don't, I've never had GIS support. And so the, the base data for, the, for those parks is, is pretty bad. 
um, other parks like Yellowstone, they have a, you know, a significant, actually pretty big GIS program. They've done a really great job. Um, and so they probably don't need as much help with like kind of the base, the base data and, but they may have, have other priorities. So, yeah. Okay. All right. I think I'm out of time, but I'll come back and talk to you. Thank you.